going to talk about Hex, which is the, or it's a package manager for Elixir and other Erlang-based languages. So before today, how many of you have heard of Hex? Awesome, awesome. And how many of you have used a Hex package? And how many of you have published a Hex package? Cool, we have a few here. So this is talk about, this is, a bit, uh, this is a bit more of a technical talk. I'm going to talk about the implementation of the Hex client and the server. And we're going to see some of the design, uh, some of the design decisions that we had to make. Um, and I will also go into details about the dependence resolution algorithm that we use. So let's start out with why I wanted to build Hex. So about half a year ago, uh, I started working on it. And the aim was to solve many of the issues with dependencies in Mix. Uh, the ecosystem was really starting to grow and we were getting more and more Elixir libraries. Um, and the only way to use an external dependency in Mix was with a JIT dependency. Uh, you can also specify an optional branch, tag, or JIT, or JIT reference. Um, and there were a few problems with this. Um, defining your dependencies uh, with JIT uh, naturally leads to people depending on JIT master because that was the, uh, the default. Uh, and that's obviously not a good thing. Um, the lock file helped with this issue. Uh, it locks your, your dependency to a specific JIT reference or tag. Uh, so it helps by ensuring repeatable builds, but there were still problems that people were depending on JIT master. And even if you are responsible and instead of using JIT master, you'd use a JIT tag uh, to get a proper, uh, to get a proper uh, to get a proper release. Uh, that also has its share of issues because if you have two dependencies uh, in your dependency tree that are essentially the same application or they are the same application, but two different people depend on it. Um, and they target the same JIT URL but have slightly different JIT tag or something. So even if they are compatible, you would have a conflict that would have to be resolved by the user by by, uh, by overriding. Uh, so those are some of the problems that uh, we were trying to solve. Um, Hex has uh, proven to be used a lot, actually. Um, today we have over 100 packages and almost over 400 releases. Um, here you see the download statistics. So we started out a few months ago. You see the week numbers uh, and the number of downloads each week. So we have a, had a quite a bit of growth the last few weeks, which is nice. Uh, in total, I think we have had almost 25,000 uh, package downloads. So I'm going to start to talk about the client, which is the uh, command line interface that you use. Um, Hex integrates with Mix, but it's a standalone application. Um, so unlike Mix, it is not bundled with Elixir Core. Uh, and you would need to install it separately. Uh, all the functionality is, is exposed through Mix tasks. Um, and a, mix, and a mixed task is a module matching a specific interface. Uh, it, has, uh, it has a module name that needs to be namespace on their mixed task, as you see. Um, and when mix starts, it looks through the load path for modules matching this interface. And because, and because, of it, and because that it looks through the load path, it can find uh, tasks that are defined in your project or in the dependencies you're using. So library authors can define tasks that will be, uh, that will be available to you when you're using those libraries as dependencies. So Hex is installed as an archive. Um, 
An archive is a zip file, essentially, that contains compiled modules uh, that the Erlang code server will treat as a normal directory. So instead of a directory with compiled modules, you have a zip file with compiled modules that you add to your code path, and uh, Erlang will handle that. Um, and when Mix starts, uh, all installed archives on your systems uh, will be loaded and the task will be uh, available to you. The one big issue with archives though is that they are installed as one big compiled blob, essentially. Um, so unlike your projects and their dependency that are recompiled when your Elixir version changes, um, Instead of that, you have, um, you have to handle that differently. Um, and that's an issue because Elixir does not ensure binary compatibility between versions. So when 1.0 is released, um, we will of course not have breaking changes uh, for source code uh, for, for quite a long while, but we cannot ensure that compiled code for a specific version will, will work with an Elixir version that has changed. Um, so to mitigate this issue, we need a, good, a nice and streamlined way to, to update Hex. So firstly, Mix ships with a task to install or update Hex. Um, Mix will also ask users to uh, install hex if it's missing and you're using a hex dependency. Um, and Mix provides tasks for installing archives and that's what we use to install hex. Um, an archive is installed by giving a URL to Mix uh, and at the end of that URL on some server somewhere you have an, an, uh, an archive that will be fetched. And <clears throat> When we install hex, we need to ensure that a hex version is installed that is compatible with that specific Elixir version. So we do this by giving a URL to the uh, hex API server. And the API server will uh, inspect the HTTP user agent, which includes the Elixir version. And we will redirect to the correct hex archive that is compatible. So finally, uh, the integration with Mix that Hex does um, that, allows, that allows us to use uh, packages as dependencies uh, is done through the remote converter. Um, I'll talk more about what the re uh, remote converter does in just a moment. Um, to explain, we will run through what happens uh, when you call the uh, command to fetch dependencies. Uh, so first off, we, we, uh, we run the mix converter. Um, the mix converter traverses your dependency tree. While it does this, it does some sanity checks, some, some sanity checks to make sure that uh, all dependencies are correct. And we flatten the tree to a set of unique dependencies. So the converter starts by collecting the top level dependencies from your mix file. Uh, as it is doing this, the JIT dependencies are being fetched. We skip hex packages for the moment because they will be handled in a later stage. So we recurse down this dependency tree uh, and we do the same thing for the children of the package of the dependencies we just fetched. Um, and as we recurse down this way, we need to converge dependencies, uh, essentially merge dependencies that have this has the same application name. And that is because the Erlang runtime doesn't allow application and modules to, uh, they need to be unique essentially. Um, you can't have two applications, you, uh, you can't have two, uh, two versions of the same application loaded at the same time. So we will converse dependencies if their definitions match. Uh, if they do not match, uh, we will mark them as diverged, and, the, and they do not match if they point to different URLs uh, for JIT dependencies or if they use different tags and so on. So we need to make sure that it's really the same dependency. Um, so we mark them as diverged if this happens, and we need to present an error to the, to the user. 
So finally, after we have flattened this, uh, this dependency tree and merged it into a single list of unique dependencies, um, after that, we need to sort them based on the interdependencies in the tree. And we need to sort them because, of course, Elixir has meta programming. So we might have dependencies calling code in other dependencies at compile time. So it's important that we compile all dependencies in the correct order. But before this sorting happens, we call into the remote converter, which is a module that is, re that is registered by hex. Um, and here's where we, where we leave mixed land and enter into hex land. Um, and this is where the dependency resolution, the dependency resolution happens that makes sure that we have a compatible set of hex packages. And the reason why we run the converter that handles JIT dependencies before we run the, the, uh, the remote converter is because we need to find any JIT dependencies that itself, that them, that them itself has hex packages as dependencies. Um, so we can include them in the dependencies, in the, in the dependency resolver. Uh, but before we run the dependency resolver, we need to make sure that we have an up-to-date uh, up registry on the local computer. Um, the registry is essentially a ETS table that we have serialized to a file. And an ETS table, for those of you who don't know, is uh, basically an in-memory key-value database. Um, and this is what the contents of the registry looks like. Uh, so we have, you see, Ecto and Postgrex, which are package names. We list all the versions um, for them. And for every uh, package and version pair, we will list all the dependencies and the version requirements on those dependencies. And we need to run the, uh, and we need to fetch the registry every time we, we run the dependency resolution to ensure that we have an up-to-date copy. Um, today we have slightly over 100 packages <laughs> and almost 400 releases. And this file will weighs in at, at about 27 kilobytes and five kilobytes compressed. So I'm not too worried about the size right now, but the problem is that we need to fetch this file every time we run the dependency resolution. Uh, we, of course, use conditional HTTP requests. So if, the, so if the registry has not changed, we will not update, we will not download the registry. So there's definitely room for improvement here. Uh, I know that the Ruby gem, uh, Ruby Gems uh, people have, I'm not sure if they are using or if they are going to start to use an append-only file for the registry. So they use HTTP range headers to only fetch what is absolutely required. So if only one package has been added, they don't need to, re, uh, to re-download the whole registry. They can only fetch that specific line with that information. So I'm going to talk about, about a bit about how the dependency resolution algorithm works. And this is what, so we feed this algorithm with all the dependencies that we have found during the first converter run, uh, all the hex dependencies that we have found. And to explain this, I need to, uh, to, to talk a bit about the terminology that we're using here. We use pending requests for hex packages that, have, that we have not yet processed, and we call, and the packages that we have processed uh, are called activated packages. So we start at number one here and add all the dependencies uh, from the that we found during the converging, and we add them as pending requests. So what we start doing is that we take the next pending request, we find the latest matching release, i.e. the latest version of the package, and we compare it against all the packages that we have activated to ensure that we can find a version where all the version requirements match. 
if we don't find such a match, we need to backtrack to a later stage, uh, which I will explain in just a moment. So if we found a matching version, we will activate that package. So we add it to the list of activated packages. We will add the dependencies, i.e. the children of that package to the list of pending requests. And now we save this state for backtracking. So if we at some point later fail to find a matching version of a package, we can backtrack to this uh, uh, place and we can choose a different version for this package and hopefully be able to continue with the dependency resolution. So, um, as you can imagine, this uh, algorithm has very high time complexity. So that might be, might be a problem in the future. Today, I have not seen any combination of packages uh, that have caused this algorithm to run away in time. Um, the pros with this algorithm is that if there is a solution, uh, we will always find it, uh, which is good, of course. Um, another problem, though, is that since we're doing this, since if we start to fail with the dependency solution, we will start doing this kind of backtracking all the time. So it's hard to find the place where we failed uh, in the resolution. So it's so if the dependency uh, if the resolution fails, it's very hard to tell the user where the problem is because the problem is a combination of all the packages you're using. So. Um, Let's continue with the last stage of the depth-get command, uh, which is to fetch the um, hex packages. Uh, the packages are packaged into tarballs, uh, which I will go into more detail of in just a moment. Um, and just like with the registry file, the tarballs, the tarballs are cached locally, and we will only download them if they actually changed. Um, we've also recently started to do parallel downloads of, uh, of the tarballs uh, to increase the performance. And even before we started doing that, fetching the tarballs was much, much faster than downloading JIT projects. So this is what a tarball looks like. So it's named with the package name and the version. Um, and the darker green colors here are the files in the, in the tarball. So first we have the version file, which is just the version of the tarball. So if something changes um, in how the tarball is, is represented, we need to increment this number. We also have a metadata file, uh, which contains the package name, the version, description, and so on. We also have this, the checksum that, of course, is a checksum of all the files. Um, and we have the contents file, which is all the files that the package author decided to include with the package. And this file is, as, as, as you can see, it is compressed. Um, it basically contains all the source code, the mix file of the project, uh, possible config files, and so on that are, that are required to compile and run the package. And the reason why, why we bundle source code instead of compiled modules is because, um, as I said previously, we do not ensure binary backwards compatibility uh, for Elixir. Um, so we need to recompile, so we need to compile the dependency every time we fetch it. Uh, additionally, you may have config files or you may have a specific combination of dependencies that changes the compilation process. Um, so we basically need to recompile uh, every time. So next, I'm going to talk about the server side of things. Um, the server is at the URL hex.pm. Um, so first I'm going to talk about how, how publishing a package works. So we start in the top left corner where you see the client. Um, when, the, 
when the client calls the, the hex publish task, we compile the tarball and we upload it to the uh, HTTP API. And the API, and the API server will, will validate the tarball uh, to see if everything is correct. We check the metadata, we check the package uh, version and so on. Um, and then we need to, uh, and then we upload the tarball to a content delivery network. And we rebuild the ETS registry file and save it to a file and, and upload that as well to the same content, de content delivery network. So we have the HTTP API. It is built with the plug, which is a library for, it's basically a library for interfacing between web applications. Um, and it's built with Ecto, which is uh, a library that is a, persistent la a persistence layer um, that is backed against a Postgres database. So this is really a case of dog fooding. Um, Jose built uh, Plug and I built uh, Ecto. And I think uh, the Hex API was one of the first, if not the first production system that used Plug. And even though Plug is a very powerful library, it is not a complete web framework or, or web library to build an API. Um, it provides some convenient functionality to make uh, it, it, it provides some community functionality though, such as a, a router and plugs for parsing and uploading files. Um, but there are a few things you need to implement yourself. Uh, HTTP, H, HTTP caching, authentication, uh, you need to provide your own parsers for any ser serialization formats you want to use. Um, but what is good is that uh, the plug architecture makes it very easy to add such functionality yourself uh, because, uh, because plug builds on, it wants you to build units of code called plugs uh, that you can compose to build a full HTTP uh, API. And we're starting to see a few uh, web, fr web frameworks being developed today. And in the future, we may want to move Hex to one of these frameworks. Um, but what I would really like to see is smaller libraries emerge that build on top of Plug to provide some specific functionality. For example, we could have a small library for handling authentication or for handling uh, HTTP caching, and because it's so easy to comp to compose plugs, they could be used to build a full uh, web application. Right, so um, I'm going to talk about the uh, Elixir format that we are using, which is a it's a serialization format just like JSON, which uh, serializes to Elixir terms. Uh, which is basically Elixir code that is uh, that doesn't have any logic. It just has the literal values, um, and we use it when we have the uh, command line client that is communicating when it's communicating with the HTTP, HTTP API. And the reason why we are not using uh, JSON is because when Hex was started to being developed, we thought that it would was going to be merged into Mix at some point later. And then we can't add a dependency to an external library. Um, additionally, it's important to keep the binary size of the hex archive small if we are going to expect most Elixir users to, to install it. So we're using this format uh, to communicate. Um, and serialization is pretty easy. It is basically a call to the inspect protocol, which the inspect protocol takes the data structure and converts it and converts it to its string representation. So that's pretty easy. Uh, deserialization is the evaluation of the string. 
but we can't deserialize any Elixir code. So because we don't, of course, we don't want code evaluation on the server. Uh, so first we need to make sure that the string is safe to evaluate. And we need to make sure that we, we, re, uh, we, we reject all code that is not literal terms. So what we do is we just parse the string and we traverse the AST to make sure we don't have any code that is not literal values. Um, but there are issues with using a actively be actively developed uh, language as your serialization format because when the language changes so does your format and you never want your serialization format to change um, and this happened with the introduction of maps uh, and with the introduction of maps we deprecated uh, list dicts so now to support the older hex client which which uses list dicts we need to we need to traverse the, uh, the data to convert all the list sticks to maps on the server. Um, and this is not essentially a problem with this specific format because if we, for example, use term to binary, which is the Erlang provided binary serialization format for all terms, and it's an issue as well. But it's something, if I was able to redo this, I would have probably choose some, some other solution for the serialization. So here is the, uh, the HEX website. It is meant to be a place to find and browse for packages. Um, and being able to easily find a package that solves your specific problem is very important for the package manager to be used. If you can't find the package you're looking for, you're not going to use the package manager. Um, so we recently added support for full text search of the package description. So if there's a, yes, so if there's a JSON package, for example, um, uh, without JSON in the name, you can still search for JSON and find the any packages that matches that search term. Um, I would also like to add a, uh, the ability here to sort after number of downloads so that it's easier to find the more popular packages. Um, and on the website, we also have some guides. We have a user guide, uh, we have a guide for publishing packages, and uh, documentation for all the mixed tasks that text provide. So the website part of the server is like the API, also built with plug. Uh, the design is a simple Twitter bo uh, bootstrap design, uh, which I hope we can change in the future. Um, since we display user-provided content on the website, for example, the package descriptions, um, we need a way to automatically HTML escape strings in the templating system that we're using. Um, so we had to add this to the EEX templating system. And Jose and Chris have recently worked to improve the, inform uh, the performance of of these uh, templates. So they're really fast now, which is nice. And in the future, I hope that we can extract this to a library with other HTML helpers and convenience functions. So next on to the download st st statistics. Uh, this is a feature I really like. Um, so if you've been to the Hex website, you have seen that we have provide daily, weekly, and total download statistics for all packages and releases. Um, and I think this is a, uh, an important feature because it shows the package authors that their package is used. And, uh, <coughs> and developers love to, to have their stuff used and they love numbers and metrics and, uh, and so on. So I think that's a really nice use uh, feature. And calculating the download statistics, as you've seen, the, the, the tarballs are hosted on a content delivery network. Um, so calculating the download statistics is a daily job that fetches the, we're using Amazon S3 for the content delivery. 
so it fetches the, the S3 logs from the previous day, and we parse them uh, and insert them into the database. And the Amazon logs are really useful in other ways uh, because they include the user agent, and the user agent includes the Elixir version and the Hex version, so we can see the versions of Elixir that people are using and the version of Hex people are using and so on. So that's really nice uh, insight that we're getting. Um, so finally, I want to talk a bit about the future of Hex and things I want to add or, or improve. Um, first off, we are going to support installable executables. Today, you can only use Hex packages as dependencies. But we want to support installable executables through eScripts. And eScripts are basically like a code archive. It, con it contains uh, compiled code um, that is prefixed. And it's a zip file that, con that contains compiled code, but it's prefixed with a script and a shebang so that you can uh, uh, execute this file. Uh, and you can run it from the command line. And initially, I wanted to support this just in Hex, but we found that we can support eScripts, installing eScripts uh, through Mix directly. And so we use the existing functionality to fetch dependencies in Mix. Um, and we have tooling, we have had tooling in Mix for some time to, uh, to build eScripts. So as you can see here, at the top, we have uh, the usual definitions for, for dependencies. Uh, at, the top we have a, at the very top, we have a JIT dependency. And at the second line, we have a, a hex dependency. So we want to use this way to install eScripts as well. So if you look at the line below, we have uh, the proposal for how the, this task will look like. So you just call eScript install and the and the and the SCM that you're using to to fetch a dependency, you will also give to this task. So you give the URL just like you define your dependency, and you can do the same thing for 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 hex packages, of course. So after we have fetched a uh, this project, we can just run the task to build the script, and we can then copy it to your path so that the so that the executable is available to you. And if you want more information about this, there is a proposal on the core mailing list about this. So Hex is meant to be a package manager for all Beam languages, so not just for Elixir. We want to support Erlang as well. And today you can publish packages for any language as long as you have Elixir installed. Um, but that's but that's where the support for other languages end today. Uh, in the future, we want to provide proper tools for, for publishing and fetching packages for Erlang users. Um, also want to provide community-owned packages. So this is an idea we had very recently. So we have problems that um, JIT dependencies of hex packages doesn't work. Because if you remember earlier, the mix converger that fetches the the JIT packet, the JIT dependencies runs before the dependency resolution, so we can't. And because the depend and, and and because the dependency resolver can only work with known packages, we need to know all the versions. We need to know the dependencies uh, and the version requirements on the dependency. And because of that, we cannot really work with JIT dependencies. Um, and we realize that this might be an issue for some projects that are not yet on, on Hex. So because the author may not have published it yet or may not want to publish it. Um, so if we, for example, have a bunch of projects that depend on a web server, uh, on a particular web server that have not been published to Hex, it can become a community-owned package instead. And, create, and creating a community-owned package would just be to send a pull request uh, to some specific uh, 
uh, repository. And that pull request would, come, uh, would contain a metadata file um, that describes the package. And when a new release is made of the package, uh, you can make another pull request that increments the version. And we could have automatic tooling that from the pull request of the, after it's merged, we will publish uh, it as a hex package. All right, uh, that's it for me. Um, do you have any questions? Um, so it seems pretty straightforward to run a private hex server. Um, could you resolve dependencies with it with multiple sources? So say you have a private server and then you also use the public server. There's no way today to have multiple sources of packages. You can use your own private uh, Hex server, which could be a superset of the of the main repository uh, or the main registry. Uh, I want to support multiple sources in the future. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, hi, I've got two questions. Uh, one, what made you decide to not add hex to mix directly and keep it separate? And two. Uh, do you maybe know if your dependency resolution algorithm differs from the one that Ruby's bundler uses? And if so, how? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So the idea at the beginning was to merge hex into mix eventually. Uh, but, um, but we're approaching 1.0 uh, very soon for Elixir and mix is and mix is bundled with Elixir, of course, and Mix is at this point more mature than Hex, so we want to still release new versions of Hex, and we might change stuff and so on. So at this point, we can't really merge it into Mix. And the second question was, how the dependency resolution algorithms differs from RubyGems, right, and Bundler? Um, so it's very close. Uh, to that algorithm. It's based on that algorithm, essentially. Um, I don't know if there's any major changes. Uh, I don't think so. We support some additional stuff that I'm not sure bundle supports, for example, uh, Bundler or RubyGem supports, because I developed them independently. Uh, for example, uh, overriding uh, dependencies we had to add to the the algorithm uh, support for that so it's 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 still very close but it's different in a few places and I think and and I think we also support op op optional dependencies which you right. don't really have in correct in those yeah um, something that I miss going from I, I used to do build engineer stuff with RPM and Deb is the like aliases or pseudo dependencies of you can have a dependency that any other package can say they fulfill but they don't actually have to be that dependency so you can be like i fulfilled java and openjdk can supply that or like so that multiple libraries could implement the same module name and you could pick whose implementation you like the best then and you don't have to worry about you pick which one you like you don't have to or they supply a given um uh, registered, um, I guess, service, is that the term in early? Or, uh, so like you, you supply an endpoint that you can talk to or a PID that they can talk to and anyone can supply it, but you just say you supply it so they can, re they can resolve that dependency and you don't have to worry about that guy got to it first, he has that name, no one can implement that ever again because the names will collide. All right, okay. Um. So we don't have support for that kind of semantics in Hex. And I'm not really sure if I want to add it because um, Elixir is a dynamic language. So imposing those kind of restraints, uh, restrictions and so on may not be suitable for Elixir. But um, we can talk about uh, uh, um, I'm sorry, uh, we can talk a bit more later. Uh, it sounds like an interesting idea. Yeah. Uh, you talked a little bit about the problems you had with serialization and deserialization. 
um, and you said that if you could go back, you would change things. I was wondering if you had any ideas about what you would have used. No, um, not really. Um, using the Elixir, uh, the Erlang provided serialization format to serialize the binary format would probably have been easier because you wouldn't have to implement such stuff to check if something is safe code, basically. Um, but it would not have solved the issue, which is the main issue I have, where we have to support older clients which use different data structures, basically. Uh, the best way would probably have been to include some kind of JSON or probably a simpler serialization format directly implemented in hex instead. Uh, yeah, uh, just a simple question. Um, would including hex in mix make it more difficult to use hex for non-Elixir languages? Would you need it all anyway, in that, in that sense? Uh, that's a good question. Um, actually, using hex for other languages is a very good reason for not including it in mix, because uh, the idea today to support Erlang tooling is to have basically build an e-script uh, of hex that implements the functionality that mix has to run tasks and so on so we use the existing code uh, in hex and basically builds a wrapper around that and that wrapper code would have to be i mean there's no reason for it to be in elixir core because it has nothing to do with elixir so um, if we if we were to merge hex into mix we would still have to have code outside of, of, of the core, basically. Um, first, uh, I'd like to really thank you for making this, because uh, it's uh, thankless and uh, miserable to make a dependency <laughs> resolver. I wrote one for a different community, and it's miserable. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, so I have two questions. Uh, one of them is you began briefly to talk about community-run packages. Mm -hmm. And that sounds amazing because the greatest problem right now in a large application is when you have hex dependencies that have git dependencies. And you have to document that, and that's uh, a tough deal. Um, and uh, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on that. Will it look like a homebrew git repository or something like that? Yeah, so it will be very similar to, uh, to homebrew. Uh, each package would basically have a metadata file which describes, which is, which is the metadata you provide in your mix file today when you publish a package. So it's the, the, the description, the version, package name, and so on. And it will also need to provide, so if you want to automate this, it would also need to provide information on how to fetch the project. So a JIT URL and the, probably the tag um, so that we can automate this. Um, but yeah, very similar to, to Homebrew. That sounds great. Uh, the second question is uh, optional dependencies. What does that look like when you run mix steps get? How do you put the ownership on the user to know how they're fetching that? It would change quite a bit, right? Right. So uh, Plug is a good example of this. Plug is a a interface between web applications and web servers. So we can have a common interface for a bunch of different web servers. And when developing Plug, as the developer of Plug, you want to use all the web servers, basically, to test them and to test all the different, uh, all the different adapters. Um, so we mark, but, but people that use Plug as a dependency only want a specific web server. So we mark all the, all the web servers that Plug supports, we mark as optional. So unless you add a specific web server as a dependency besides Plug, it will not fetch. So Plug may support like 10 web servers, and you don't want to add those uh, dependencies to your project. It will only add the dependency that, uh, that you want to use. but. 
what's good with this, with optional dependencies, is that we can use the version requirement that Pug has on that web server, so in the dependency resolution algorithm where we ensure that we have compatible packages, we can use that version requirement as well. All right. Hey, uh, let's, uh, Eric's, you know, he, he's written Hex, and he's a core contributor, and he traveled all the way from Europe to share his time with us. Let's give him a big hand. <laughs>